Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores experience and meaning and their impact on individuals and the broader society. Some of you noted that I sounded sick for a while in some of my shorts, and you're right. I was down for a bit with some sort of cough slash cold, and one thing that I learned is that it's hard to record long form when you're coughing. So I'm glad that it's over, I'm doing better, and thanks to everybody who asked. I had initially planned to talk about the trail of tears in this episode, but I got so derailed by other things that I found that I never got past Andrew Jackson's presidency to reach Martin Van Buren, who actually oversaw most of that particular death march. It's mentioned in the episode, but it's definitely not discussed in any detail, and I wanted to also be sure to issue the standard disclaimers. I'm not a historian. I'm not a lawyer. I have no specialized background or training of any kind. All I did was sit down to look into these people and these events the same way anyone else might, and I'm reporting what I found, the thoughts I had about it, and I'm providing as many sources as I can so that anyone is welcome to follow behind me and check for themselves. I also want to note that I did considerable reading about labels and their application to Native Americans, and I landed on, quote, Native Americans, unquote, as the label that I'm using in this episode. I had initially written a lot about how I came to that decision, but suffice to say, I did take into account a number of websites representing Native tribes and nations. No solution was perfect, but this is the one I will be using. When I first started to pull together information for this script, I thought maybe I had misremembered my education. In this case, I'm not claiming things like the Trail of Tears aren't covered in schools. I'm saying that the framing may leave us with an impression that is narrow in scope. The information is out there, though. It isn't hidden or buried or locked away. We just don't generally go looking for it to reread it once we're out of school. We take what we were taught into this world with us, and we assume that we've learned history. But when I look back on these issues as an adult, I realize that these are not minor historic footnotes. Depending on your values, these can be huge issues being brushed aside so that we can mythologize the foundations of our nation in the United States. In my prior activism, people used to defend biblical slavery, genocide, subjugation of women, and wars to invade and claim land. They would describe biblical slavery as some sort of humane slave state. They would say that the people being genocided were wicked and deserved it down to the last child. They would say that women were well treated. They would say that God granted this land to the Hebrews, and they would glorify men who were described doing horrible things, such as Abraham trying to offer his own child as a sacrifice. Someone with a biblical upbringing could hear the same story as someone raised secularly and think Abraham was a great man, and that the attempted sacrifice was a demonstration of great faith. But to the person who is secular, it might seem horrifying to think of venerating anyone who would attempt such a horrible thing. If people with biblical upbringings had their own currency, it's completely conceivable that they might have Abraham on a $5 bill. And it would be completely conceivable for someone outside the religion to see these types of honors bestowed on someone who had done some of the things that Abraham did as shocking. If someone told you to consider how these genocides were necessary to expand the Hebrew territory and that they believed that was their birthright, and that rather than focus on the mass murders of adults and children, you should look at what the Hebrews accomplished with this land, it would be entirely up to you to decide how to frame this situation based on your values. Should it be glorified or should it be memorialized as a tragic and needless loss of life? Many of the same people who are hot to condemn biblical slavery, genocide, subjugation of women, and wars of expansion will turn right around and say that we shouldn't focus on slavery, genocide, subjugation of women, and wars of expansion in U.S. history, that it should not mar the greatness of our foundations. And I'm given the same justifications— People didn't know any better back then, and we weren't the only ones with the institution of slavery, and, and, and anything it takes so that we can say, sure, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, but look at all the good things that he did for the other wealthy land-owning cishet white men. Depending on your values, enslaving people can be a big deal, like a big, big deal. And there have always been people opposed to it 
who saw clearly it was wrong, and who said as much. The U.S. South wouldn't have had to ban abolitionist literature in mail coming to the southern states if nobody was promoting abolition. And when you keep people from an education and literacy to make sure that they don't get any dangerous ideas like emancipation and revolt, then you know that education and literacy can lead people to understand that slavery is not okay. But we are so invested in the narrative that the U.S. was set up as a shining city on a hill, a democracy broken away from monarchy, except we were never set up as a democracy. The founders didn't want a democracy and didn't create one. In fact, I think it's fair to describe what they set up as an oligarchy. It's no accident that some of the wealthiest families in the colonies were also those of the founders. Andrew Werman, an associate professor of history at Central Michigan University, is quoted at Voice of America saying that John Adams was outspoken about not wanting women or people without money to have a vote. He also points out that initially, only the House of Representatives was elected by the people. The people, of course, being only those allowed to vote. Important to note that states set most voting rights in the U.S. initially, but most of them had the same restrictions. The Electoral College chooses the president, the commander-in-chief selects the Supreme Court justices, and originally, senators were selected by the state legislatures. I remember studying the suffragettes and the struggle for the vote for white women, but it wasn't threaded together in a way that made me realize that the Founding Fathers saw me as something less than compared to their fully human status. Before the founding of the nation, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence that they held it to be true that all men were created equal and endowed with rights, they meant all white men. And to them, this was so obviously the only thing they could mean that they didn't even bother to clarify. Who else could they possibly mean by people? What was actually self-evident was that all they really did was break the crown and then divide it between a privileged thin slice of the continent's demographic to govern. This thin slice could then be pleaded with by the disempowered lesser beings, the actual majority, to consider their causes. This sounds more like an oligarchy than a democracy to me. And as we've seen, civil rights progress in the U.S. is a bloody affair. I'm put in mind of that quote, Nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were oppressing them. The founders wanted a system where a small minority were empowered and everyone else was subjugated, where the wealthy white men decided whose petitions would be granted and whose would be slapped down. That's the nation they built on purpose. And that's the nation we still struggle to fix while working within the very system set up to oppress most of the people on the continent. I often wonder how much easier it would be if we could actually just install a new system that includes input from everyone this time and work in that new system to ensure rights and power and access to necessary resources for everyone. The U.S. has been hobbling along trying to patch up and drag the Constitution kicking and screaming into the modern age, amendment after amendment after amendment, and we're still fighting over land rights with Native Americans, still doing slavery, still oppressing black people and communities, and still arguing about whether you need consent to use someone's body if they have a uterus. I question the wisdom of sticking with this legal model more and more as I learn about the views and the intentions of the people who created it. The oppression has changed form, but it's never ended, and I'm not sure it can end while we continue to be loyal to working within a system that was created to promote and enforce that oppression. If I told you I had a group of people ready to write a new constitution for us, and that they didn't see a problem with including slavery or pursuing genocide or going to war to expand our borders and stripping women of the vote, I would hope that you'd tell me we can do better. And when people say it's unfair to hold our founders accountable because of their context and history, they're kind of missing the point. The question isn't whether it's fair to expect them to have centuries of foresight. The question is whether it's reasonable to maintain a foundation for our nation that was created by men whose views are embarrassingly regressive in the world that we actually do have to live in and navigate centuries later. 
I don't really care if we can find a way to make sense of their horrendous ignorance based on the times in which they lived. I care that that ignorance of centuries ago continues to be revered and clung to as our system of government and law. I think it's fair to ask whether it might be time to create a constitution that reflects current values from the ground up and has input from more than just a small demographic of society. At what point do you stop trying to patch that old tire and just kick down for a new tire? At any rate, maybe it's time for us to look around at good ideas in more current constitutions and see what's on offer. Rights like healthcare access and housing and income might be a good start, but that's a topic for another day. Today I'm supposed to be talking about something something and the history we learned and what we remember and what gets downplayed and forgotten. And because public school in the U.S. is different depending on where you live, these talks may be more or less applicable to you. You may be very familiar with all of this, but I'm banking on the idea that there will be a few folks who will find that there's a lot here that they didn't know or don't remember. Because I had originally planned to talk about the Trail of Tears, I had to back it up for context to Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of these United States. His story starts with those iconic, humble beginnings. However humble his beginnings, though, he had the support and the means at his disposal to wind up a prominent bar-certified attorney while still a young man. Also, for someone with so little privilege, I say sarcastically, he managed to enter a religious education where he was taught reading, writing, math, Greek, and Latin. I'm skeptical this sort of educational access was a standard part of the lives of most young boys in the U.S. at the time, let alone women or anyone who wasn't white. But eventually, he entered the military, where he became somewhat of a military hero for his participation in the Revolutionary War. One of the articles I found said Jackson despised political privilege. And this is what I mean about whitewashing history and the disconnect between what we're taught and reality. This man, who rose to power in a nation that was created to heap political privilege on wealthy, powerful white men, became president because of political privilege. He never had to compete for anything against women or non-whites. And it's ridiculous to think that if he had grown up in a nation where everyone actually was respected and empowered to the same degree, that he would have become president. In fact, his popularity was built on those prejudices that made wealthy white men the empowered elite of the nation. Bigotry against black people and Native Americans thrilled his constituents who, like Jackson himself, enslaved people and dreamed of the day those pesky Native people would just disappear and stop standing in the way of what he considered to be U.S. progress. If this nation weren't patriarchal and white supremacist, would Jackson have stood a chance without those features to make him popular with like-minded people? It sounds to me like he despised political privilege, except his own. So by the time this man who hated political privilege was 20, he had begun buying enslaved people. Because there's no political imbalance there, right? But this is the issue with how these lessons are taught. Today, as an adult, having begun to pay attention to marginalized people and their experiences, I see the disconnect. But in school, if they had told me that Jackson hated political privilege, I would have simply absorbed that and thought, Oh yeah, that's a good thing. It wouldn't occur to me to point out that his entire political career was dependent on it, and that he owned enslaved people, which is about as much of a political power divide as you can create, with the exception of perhaps trying to make entire ethnicities disappear, which, well, we'll get to that in a bit. Tennessee became a state in 1796, and that's what started Jackson's political career. He became a representative of this new state, and that's also where he started his political policy of violence against Native Americans. He had a few different jobs in Tennessee, including senator and judge. He also leveraged his military background with the state's militia, where he became a commander. From early on, Jackson had a lot of skin in the game of displacing Native Americans, and the more I read, the more I began to realize that U.S. expansion was fueled by money. Not just settlers and plantations and farms, but investment, specifically land speculation. This actually was something that made a lot of sense, but that 
I hadn't ever thought about before. I was taught about settlers buying land, but I don't remember learning about land speculation. I read a book many years ago that talked about this. It described how you might see a grocery store chain and some fast food restaurants being built in an area that seems rural. The book described how corporations watch city planning and development to decide where to put in new outlets. If they see a city starting to plan for outward growth with plans to expand roads, for example, they know that housing is going to happen. And they want to get ahead of that by purchasing property before the prices skyrocket as more development starts to happen. So they buy early and start to build and then wait for the infrastructure to catch up, apartments, houses, gas stations, Starbucks, etc. As more people and businesses start buying up property, the price of land increases. So with land speculation, I might be in on this. Not because I want to build anything, but because I see the trend. And so I buy raw property and I just sit on it waiting for that spike in the land prices. Sometimes you see a plot of raw land that's just sitting between some church and a gas station with nothing on it, just undeveloped. Someone owns that property. And if there's a lot of growth, they've probably received offers on it. But they're waiting for more and more development that creates less and less available land that will drive up the price so they can sell at a profit. That's land speculation. But in order to make money this way, you need a lot of raw, undeveloped land. As it turns out, Jackson was into land speculation. In fact, he was able to purchase quite a bit of land in hopes of selling at a good profit. But he did this on credit and suffered huge financial losses when the market collapsed at the turn of the century between the 17 and 1800s. One article said he nearly bankrupted, but I had to laugh because he apparently saved himself by selling off 25,000 acres that he'd purchased on speculation and trading it for a modest 420-acre plantation that came to be called the Hermitage. Oh, and that purchase price also included enslaved people as well as land. I guess this is what constitutes broke for men who become U.S. presidents. Another interesting whitewash of history is that articles about this time in Jackson's life say that he became a successful planter and merchant. But the man enslaved people to work his land. Was he really a successful planter, or were the people he enslaved actually successful planters? It didn't take long to answer that. He expanded his holding at the Hermitage to 1,000 acres, and it became one of the largest cotton plantations in Tennessee, all made possible by the people enslaved to do his labor for him. So his wealth was grown using exploited labor from the political privilege he claimed to despise. Imagine that Jackson couldn't violently steal his land and brutally enslave people. Where would he have been then? The land he stole, the slaves he worked, no compensation was ever made. The man who nearly bankrupted himself was financially saved and allowed to prosper through violence, exploitation, and political privilege that he claimed to hate. When he died in 1845, he had over 150 enslaved people as part of his property. And this is a passage out of one of the articles that tries to portray this as a kinder, gentler form of slavery. Quote, Jackson subscribed to the paternalistic idea of slavery, which claimed that slave ownership was morally acceptable as long as slaves were treated with humanity and their basic needs were cared for. In practice, slaves were treated as a form of wealth whose productivity needed to be protected. Unquote. I'm not sure what to even call what is being described here. It's as though we're trying to say that some enslavers were good, caring people. And this is the garbage that I remember from my school days, but if you keep reading, here's what follows. Quote, Slaves who disobeyed or ran away could be harshly punished. For example, in an 1804 advertisement to recover a runaway slave, Jackson offered $10 extra for every hundred lashes any person will give him to the amount of 300 Jackson also participated in the local slave trade, over time, his accumulation of wealth in both enslaved people and land placed him among the elite families of Tennessee, unquote. This was the benevolent enslaver. And just think about the pushback on reparations today with the legacy of all this still shaping our current society. Keep in mind that to this day, there has only been one official reparation offered for U.S. slavery, and it was offered 
to the likes of this man who treated other human beings worse than most people treated farm animals. In 1862, President Lincoln signed the D.C. Compensated Emancipation Act. It required slaveholders there to free their slaves, and the federal government paid owners an average of about $300 per enslaved person. That's the equivalent of $8,000 in 2021. As a sidebar, in looking at information for this episode, I found a founding father, William Blount, who also tried to make money on real estate and land speculation. He was also nearly bankrupted and was found to have conspired with Great Britain in a plan to take Louisiana from Spain to try and boost Western land prices. You heard that right. A founding father lost his ass in real estate and thought that starting a war to violently grab territory would be a good way to fix his finances. These are the men we pay homage to today. War, even to this day, is often about resources and money, but I think we often lose sight of the fact that it was exactly the same at the founding of the nation. It wasn't better. It was the same. Wealthy, powerful men launching violent wars in order to benefit themselves, using their power to put other people's lives at risk for their financial benefit. It's actually an interesting story with a lot of blaming, finger-pointing, distractions, and even running from the law. You might want to look into it for a few laughs or cries, depending on your perspective, but hey, those are our illustrious founders. Another thing that's similar to what we see today is that when the lid broke off this conspiracy, Blount returned to Tennessee, still popular with his constituents. What's interesting is that in another article, it talked about how some of the founders didn't like the idea of democracy because they feared people would elect a demagogue. And I have to think about the irony in that. Here are these men setting up a state that runs on destroying Native people, enslaving Black people, denying rights to any non-white person or woman. They're waging wars and violence in order to line their pockets, and they're concerned that we might have a demagogue because why? A demagogue is a political leader who gains support by appealing to popular desires and prejudices of the masses. But as president, that's exactly what Jackson did. In going through his policies, he promoted displacement of Native Americans, which was wildly popular in states that wanted to expand white settlements. And he refused to enforce the laws when the states acted illegally to take that land. He also was willing to send in federal troops to support slave owners because slavery was popular in states that had slavery. And he wasn't the only president who chose whether or not to enforce laws based on whether or not it would be popularly received. I mean, these men acted as demagogues as long as it kept them in power, and they exploited that power for personal benefit. This is why I have no faith when I hear people say that history will hold Trump to account. Do we have any precedent showing that these men have ever been held to account? Ask yourself, before I told you what William Blount did, did you know? If you did know, do you realize how many other people don't know that one of our founders literally used his political clout to try to start a war to salvage his failed financial situation? And Jackson is on the $20 bill. Even Nixon managed to end his life on a high note. I'm not convinced history will hold any of these men accountable. My section on Andrew Jackson's military career is going to have to be abbreviated. The context is that the U.S. wasn't born into 50 states overnight. It evolved into a state coalition over time, with many wars between mainly the U.S., Great Britain, France, and Spain. And the native people were pretty well stuck in the middle of a mess because none of these nations actually cared about them, and all of these white forces were in this to take the land for themselves. That being said, the Native Americans were still caught in the middle of all of this and, as a result, forced to negotiate or take sides based on whatever was in their best interest in the moment. It was brutal and horrible, and the end game was to own and control the continent's resources in order for elites to exploit them for profit. And that brings us to the War of 1812. In 1812, there was a war. The U.S. wanted to expand in the South, and that meant going to war with Great Britain and Spain and Florida. A faction of Creek people, a native tribe known as the Red Sticks, was fighting with support from Great Britain. Jackson managed to overwhelm the Red Sticks and massacred them in what used to be Missouri Territory, but what is today known as Alabama. 
Jackson continued with a scorched earth policy resulting in deaths of Creek people, including children and adults, not just warriors, and he then forced the Treaty of Fort Jackson, which resulted in 23 million acres of land being relinquished not only from the Red Sticks, but also from the Creek who had fought with the U.S. Jackson then went on to attack Florida and then New Orleans. A couple of episodes involving Jackson in that war foreshadowed his coming presidency. He gathered up 2,000 volunteers to participate in the War of 1812, but by the time they arrived at their destination, they were no longer needed. It's important to note that Jackson was thin-skinned, a lot like Trump, in fact. Jackson took offense at any perceived insult or slight, and his life was riddled with many duels and brawls as a result. He had a lot of fragility for someone with so much wealth and power. And in this particular case, it was John Armstrong, the then Secretary of War, who instructed Jackson to disband his recruits. Jackson had a history with Armstrong and didn't like him personally. Jackson refused to comply with the order and marched all 2,000 men to Nashville, Tennessee instead. It would be a theme with Jackson to follow rules that profited him and ignore rules that didn't. And just to be clear, I actually am okay with people ignoring bad laws and adhering to laws that are useful and just. So I won't hypocritically say that Jackson was wrong to pick and choose which laws to enforce. Discretion and compassion are part of justice. It's not his methods I have an issue with, it's his motives. He enforced white supremacy and he ignored laws that would have protected non-white people from brutal oppression by white people. So, when the laws were there to protect non-white people, Jackson looked the other way when they were broken. But when they were there to support white supremacy, he was ready to enforce them. In fact, he was also ready to break laws if it supported white supremacy. And again, his methods don't offend me, but his motives were trash. In 1814 in New Orleans, again with Jackson, a group of Creole soldiers claimed French citizenship and asked to be excused from militia service. As a result, Jackson ordered all French citizens to leave the city within three days. He also arrested a Louisiana legislator for writing an article that criticized him for his methods. When a district judge demanded that the legislator be released, Jackson then used his military power to arrest the judge. When a military court demanded the legislator be released, Jackson refused and then evicted the judge from the city while still holding the legislator prisoner. Despite all of this, After the battle at New Orleans, he kept on leading the military in the U.S. South. He was instrumental in five treaties that were land grabs. Two of the most noteworthy were the Treaty of Tuscaloosa and the Treaty of Doak's Stand. The Treaty of Tuscaloosa was made with two Chickasaw tribal leaders to cede land that was in their possession under an earlier treaty, the Treaty of Hopewell. And for his role in this, Jackson was considered a national hero and awarded a Congressional Gold Medal. All that mattered to our government was that he secured the land, not how he managed it. Also, as a result of the new power balance, with the U.S. coming out on top, the U.S. government was able to ignore part of the Treaty of Ghent, the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812 between Great Britain and the U.S. The U.S. would have had to return the creek lands taken in the Treaty of Fort Jackson, but the British made no effort to enforce U.S. compliance. I want to share a personal story about a conversation I had with someone I know who is an anthropologist who does field research with the Kechimaya people in Guatemala. She was telling me once how the people there really have no model of representation, so when a decision has to be made that impacts the entire village, no action is taken until the entire village has to agree to it. The discussions go on for days and nights, but until an agreement or compromise is reached, nobody can act. But there are times when issues concerning the people come up through national governmental channels and the villages must be consulted because it involves native lands and resources. When this happens, the village is asked to send a few delegates to speak for them at the national government level in Guatemala. The Kechimaya don't understand the concept of representation, and the few who are sent are unable to provide answers or agreements because they're not empowered to do so on their own. When they do discuss or agree to things, they don't understand what's actually happening. However, the national government considers these interactions as official and representative of the whole village. So later, when it's reported in the media, they say that the native people were represented and agreed to this or that change in their existence, including land rights and resource access. 
The articles provide zero explanation of how these people aren't actually equipped to operate within these Western systems of representation because these systems are wholly unfamiliar to them. So when I'm reading that native tribes are working with the French or the US or the British or the Spanish, I have no idea how much they understand the full intent of these white negotiators and that their role as Native Americans, no matter who they ally with, will eventually be to simply disappear. These European and U.S. factions are using them as needed with every intent to continue encroaching upon them until they have no more land to offer, or they're all massacred or adopted and assimilated into white society, their cultures destroyed and their access to their natural resources cut off. But back to the Southern Land Expansion. The too long didn't read version of how Florida became a state was that the U.S. was expanding toward Florida and having skirmishes with the Seminoles there the more they encroached. So Jackson was deployed with the military to handle it however he wanted. He ended up executing some British nationals, waging war on Spain, and violently coercing a treaty with the Seminoles under threat. And here's another historic fact for how things stay the same in the U.S. file. In 1819, as all this violent land theft was fueling a booming real estate market, the Second Bank of the United States was doing some sketchy stuff tied to all the shady land speculation our founders had their greedy hands in. And the tomfoolery between these wealthy men and the bank over real estate threw the entire nation into a prolonged economic depression. It led to mass unemployment and plunging property values while the bank's Baltimore executives were busy committing a little fraud and larceny. Also tied to the Second Bank of the United States, here's another example of how the founders lack self-awareness and how our whitewashed history goes right along with their white supremacist thinking. Jackson actually didn't like the Second Bank of the United States, because he felt it was a for-profit entity with too much power. One article says that, quote, Jackson saw the bank as a fourth branch of government run by an elite, what he called the money power, that sought to control the labor and earnings of the real people, who depend on their own efforts to succeed, unquote. At first, this sounds pretty good. He doesn't want wealthy elites setting up a powerful institution that could ultimately influence government as much as any elected branch. And today, we're having pretty similar conversations about corporations and oligarchs. So we feel on some level a resonance with the way this is portrayed. But what happens when we zoom out a little? We see that Jackson included in this group of real people, people like himself, planters and farmers. Notice how he says that they're trying to control, quote, real people who, quote, depend on their own efforts. Reminder here that Jackson literally enslaved people to exploit their efforts for his success, repaying them with nothing but more oppression. His land was stolen through violence and extortion that he tried to paint as some sort of valid contract, either lying outright that it was agreed to voluntarily or cooking up reasons to go to war and claim legitimacy while taking it by force. This is what he frames as real people depending on their own efforts to succeed. Additionally, Jackson had a personal vendetta with paper money because of his own near bankruptcy caused by overextending himself on credit for his land speculation efforts. As an aside, in another Bizarro History tidbit, John Quincy Adams in 1824 became the president, beating out Jackson and some other contenders in a convoluted system where none of the candidates had a majority of the Electoral College votes, so the House of Representatives chose our president that year. Jackson and his supporters did all they could to undermine Adams, while, much like Trump, trying to paint his wealthy, well-connected, and powerful self as a man of the people and an ordinary citizen. You know how we're often complaining about the lack of fact check and truth in media and how we had those weird claims about pizza restaurants trafficking children for the elites in their non-existent basements? Well, Jackson during his campaign was accused of, among other things, being a cannibal. And his enemies went after his relationship with his wife so hard that people suggested her death just before the inauguration was due in part to the stress caused by all the ferocious rhetoric. As an even further aside, One of the first things Jackson did when he finally was elected and took office was launch investigations into his predecessor, Adams. He found the modern equivalent of over $7 million had been stolen from the Treasury. And the Treasury auditor, Tobias Watkins, a personal friend of the former President Adams, was found guilty of embezzlement, which, upon further reading, I learned was not a rare crime back then. 
Jackson then fired a bunch of federal employees and handed out government jobs to all his friends, to the tune of hundreds of officials. Then he settled in to do what he did best, separate Native Americans from their land and resources. In the U.S., our Supreme Court has the final say in whether or not something is constitutional. This is the ultimate court in what is known as our judicial branch of government. The legislative branch, the House and Senate, make up the bodies that pass laws, and the executive branch, which owns enforcement authority, is headed by the president. The president has tools at his disposal, such as the U.S. military. The judicial branch, that includes the Supreme Court, has no such enforcement powers. We do have checks and balances, such as the president must go through Congress to declare a war. However, that can be circumvented by sending troops without declaring a war. For example, the Korean police action is sometimes referred to as the Korean War, although no war was ever declared. So while Jackson was president, we had a dispute in Georgia. The state was illegally trying to enforce its authority on Cherokee land. There was a legal case about it that ended up before the Supreme Court of the United States, and the verdict was that Georgia had no rights to the land, and it did, in fact, belong to the Cherokee according to U.S. law. Jackson, however, made it clear that he had no intention of enforcing the law in this case, which gave Georgia a green light to continue violating Cherokee land and people. Then Congress passed something called the Indian Removal Act, and it wasn't as wildly popular as you might think. It squeaked through the House of Representatives with a 101 to 97 vote, and did a little better in the Senate where it passed 28 to 19. Unsurprisingly, it was heavily supported in the South, especially Georgia, where they were already encroaching on land. Opposition to the act came from Christian missionaries and some of the other state representatives. Columbia University has a page titled Statements from the Debate on Native American Removal, and there, Jackson has a quote that is chilling and nothing short of propaganda. Quote, It gives me pleasure to announce to Congress that the benevolent policy of the government steadily pursued for nearly 30 years in relation to the removal of the Indians beyond the white settlements is approaching to a happy consummation. Two important tribes have accepted the provision made for their removal, and it is believed that their example will induce the remaining tribes to also seek the same obvious advantage. The consequences of a speedy removal will be important to the United States, to individual states, and to the Indians themselves. It puts an end to all possible danger of collision between the authorities of the general and state governments on account of the Indians. It will place a dense and civilized population in large tracts of country now occupied by a few savage hunters. By opening the whole territory between Tennessee on the north and Louisiana on the south to the settlement of the whites, It will incalculably strengthen the southern frontier and render the adjacent states strong enough to repel future invasions without remote aid. It will relieve the whole state of Mississippi and the western part of Alabama of Indian occupancy and enable those states to advance rapidly in population, wealth, and power. It will separate the Indians from immediate contact with settlements of whites, free them from the power of the states, enable them to pursue happiness in their own way and under their own rude institutions, will retard the progress of decay which is lessening their numbers and perhaps cause them gradually to cast off their savage habits and become an interesting, civilized, and Christian community. Toward the aborigines of the country, no one can indulge a more friendly feeling than myself or would go further to reclaim them from their wandering habits and make them a happy, prosperous people. Humanity has often wept over the fate of the aborigines of this country to follow to the tomb the last of his race and to tread on the graves of extinct nations excite melancholy reflections. But true philanthropy reconciles the mind to these vicissitudes as it does to the extinction of one generation of people to make room for a another. In the monuments and fortresses of an unknown people spread over the extensive regions of the West, we behold the memorials of a once powerful race which was exterminated or has disappeared to make room for the existing savage tribes. What good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic studded with cities, towns, and prosperous farms, and filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion? Doubtless it will be painful to leave the graves of their fathers, but what do they more than our ancestors did, or than our children are now doing? To better their condition in an unknown land, our forefathers left all that was dear in earthly objects. Can it be cruel in this government when, 
by events which it cannot control, the Indian is made discontented in his ancient home to purchase his lands, to give him new and extensive territory, to pay the expense of his removal, and support him a year in his new abode? How many thousands of our own people would gladly embrace the opportunity of removing to the West on such conditions? End quote. And I'd like to read a small section of the act itself. It reads as follows, and I won't be reading the entire act, but the text is online and I encourage you to read it for yourself if you're interested. Quote, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that it shall and may be lawful for the President of the United States to cause so much of any territory belonging to the United States west of the River Mississippi, not included in any state or organized territory, and to which the Indian title has been extinguished, as he may judge necessary, to be divided into a suitable number of districts for the reception of such tribes or nations of Indians as may choose to exchange the lands where they now reside and remove there and to cause each of said districts to be so described by natural or artificial marks as to be easily distinguished from every other, unquote. Again, that is from the Removal Act of 1830, Section 1. And the next quote I'm going to read is from Edward Everett, who sat on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and delivered a speech to the House of Representatives on this very issue, in which he declared, quote, The evil, sir, is enormous, the inevitable suffering incalculable. Do not stain the fair fame of the country. Nations of dependent Indians against their will, under color of law, are driven from their homes into the wilderness. You cannot explain it. You cannot reason it away. Our friends will view this measure with sorrow and our enemies alone with joy. And we ourselves, sir, when the interests and passions of the day are past, shall look back upon it, I fear, with self-reproach and a regret as bitter as unavailing, unquote. So there are two competing narratives here. One is a paternalistic narrative that declares that this is about the best interests of the native people and that the goal is to gain voluntary consent of the tribes for the ceding of their territory. And we have another narrative that is calling this out as propaganda. And looking at further statements by Jackson and observing what actually took place, it becomes clear these events are not a benevolent motive gone wrong through faulty execution. Jackson was doing what we call putting perfume on a pig. He's trying to paint a horrifying and brutal plan as some sort of noble act with everyone's best interests at heart. So here's another aside There is something called the myth of the vanishing race that needs to be understood. It was a weirdly romanticized version of the displacement and ethnic cleansing that was happening on the continent. U.S. settlers had bought into the Manifest Destiny narrative and as a result felt that there was no stopping the expansion of white people across the continent. They saw it as inevitable. And it reminds me of something I read once in a piece called heteropatriarchy, and the three pillars of white supremacy. The author talks about genocide and colonialism and this very concept that under white supremacy, native people must disappear is portrayed here. Here's a passage and I want to share it. It's been edited for brevity. Quote, In fact, they must always be disappearing in order to allow non-native people's rightful claim over this land. Through this logic of genocide, non-native peoples then become the rightful inheritors of all that was native, land, resources, native spirituality, or culture. Native people are a permanent absence in the U.S. colonial imagination, an absence that reinforces at every turn the conviction that native people are indeed vanishing and that the conquest of native lands is justified. In a temporal paradox, Living Native Americans were induced to play dead, as it were, in order to perform a narrative of manifest destiny in which their role ultimately was to disappear. The pillar of genocide serves as the anchor for colonialism. It is what allows non-Native peoples to feel they can rightfully own Native people's land. It is okay to take the land from Native peoples because Native people have disappeared. End quote. But this sums up the concept and the role of the myth of the vanishing race, and it can be found to be reflected in art, literature, and political rhetoric during the time. 
There were other myths as well, such as the myth of the mound builders, which tried to explain away the large city complexes discovered in the Americas as the work of non-native people because the white Europeans were incapable or unwilling to accept Native American people could have been responsible for creating something that substantial. In fact, in that long quote from Jackson, you heard him refer to this. These myths helped settlers and government officials reconcile in their own heads the injustice they were perpetuating, the genocide or ethnic cleansing of the native populations, using illegal threats, bad faith negotiations, violent force, and corruption. The U.S. population was appeased by Manifest Destiny propaganda, wrapping themselves in a religious political idea that what they were doing was preordained by God. It gave them a more passive narrative in which they were swept up by the same forces and powerless to stop the inevitable. It was a narrative to appease the collective conscience of a nation bent on erasing entire civilizations. The expansion of European settlers was already underway by the time the United States was born, but the creation of the U.S. nation ramped it up significantly. Thomas Jefferson, as president, purchased over 800,000 miles from the French in 1803 as the first major expansion. And after this expansion exploded, which threw white settlers into conflict with native people already living in the territory and using the resources, people who were not factored into these expansions and land sales. So you can imagine when you're sold property with people already living there who aren't party to your culture or deed-driven land ownership concepts, conflict is going to arise. But it was under Jackson's presidency and his 1830 Indian Removal Act that things got much worse. Jackson's administration was party to over 70 negotiated removal treaties, and I use the term negotiated very loosely. It's the word used in the article on this section of history, but I think a deeper dive shows these, quote, negotiations were arrived at by threats and coercion. Certainly nothing that would constitute a voluntary real estate contract. And my mind keeps coming back to the money these men were making off land sales while they were crafting government policy toward taking more land. When Donald Trump used his own hotels to host government workers, it was reported as scandalous. The idea of a president making money from his control of executive branch decisions struck many citizens as exploitative at best and a corrupt use of government power to line his own pockets at worst. We now expect presidents to divest when they enter office and to share their financial statements so that the citizenry can be informed about any potential conflicts of interest that could impact public policy. We don't require it, but we expect it. Imagine that a president, making money off land deals and large acreage slave plantation operations, was openly passing laws to force displacement of existing communities and waging bloody wars if they refused to comply, in order to expand U.S. land holdings, off of which he and his peers were building substantial wealth. Jackson's own statements make it clear that he not only saw Native Americans as impediments to what he considered civilization, but also, they made it difficult for settlers to safely move into expanded territories because they competed for local resources. And part of the point of obtaining huge swaths of land was, after all, to sell it for profit. At his annual message to Congress in 1830, we read previously how Jackson put a happy face on the violent displacement and ethnic cleansing of Native American populations, calling it benevolent policy and happy consummation, he calls it liberal and generous. He claims he is saving these people from utter annihilation. Such happy framing for a reality where, if Native Americans don't want to be assimilated or genocided, they need to abandon their own lands. This is propaganda. Painting this as some sort of voluntary happy agreement is quite a perversion. Anti-trans laws today are painted as concern for children, rather than upholding sexist hierarchies. Laws that attack the basic humanity of AFAB people in the form of converting them to forced incubators to birth the next generation of laborers are painted as coming from a place of concern for women. This paternalistic rhetoric is often used as a thin veil to mask truly horrifying and malevolent motives. Behind these flowery words, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole people were subjected to unimaginable suffering, along with others, as a result of Jackson's plans. 
His successor, both chronologically and ideologically, Martin Van Buren, oversaw the forced removal of the Cherokee people to Oklahoma in 1838 to 1839, famously known as the Trail of Tears, as U.S. settlers continued to encroach on shrinking territories of native tribes. This was escalated when gold and silver were discovered in the West. Additionally, new federal legislation like the Indian Appropriations Act of 1851 forcibly moved native groups onto government-sanctioned reservations. Later, the Homestead Act of 1862 and the Dawes Act of 1887, signed by President Abraham Lincoln and Grover Cleveland, broke up native lands further and privatized them for sale to white settlers. All of these laws escalated conflicts and violence between Native American and U.S. military forces. In a lot of the reading, the motive is described as being things like land, resources, and sovereignty. But really, it was about wealth. It was a pursuit of power in order to violently control resources through any means necessary in order for wealthy men like the founders and those who came after them in their likeness to exploit the land and resources for money. Returning to Jackson, though, in summary, he's saying that genocide is no different than an older generation dying off as another comes of age. He's invoking the racist myth of the mound builders that we touched on earlier to declare that some superior race must have been defeated by the current bands of savages who couldn't possibly have built these structures that they're finding across North America. And ironically, he's asking who would rather live on a continent where nature is respected and protected rather than in an urban area or on a farm. I have friends who prefer the city life, but honestly, as someone who enjoys hiking and camping, the landscape that Jackson is denigrating as undeveloped trash is the one I prefer, and it's extremely hypocritical for a man who lived on a 420 plus acre country plantation to pretend he sees city life as superior. But there's even more irony in the fact that all this glorious industry and progress has resulted in the demise of the natural world for all of us, not just the native populations. Going forward, these resources that he refused to respect and protect, growing populations will struggle to compete for as they dwindle. And even with this knowledge, we still can't stop ourselves from continuing to exploit and destroy them. But it's that last bit of that longer quote that really lays it bare. Quote, it will separate the Indians from immediate contact with settlements of whites, free them from the power of the states, enable them to pursue happiness in their own way and under their own root institutions, will retard the progress of decay which is lessening their numbers, and perhaps cause them gradually under the protection of the government and through the influence of good counsels to cast off their savage habits and become an interesting, civilized, and Christian community. He ends by admitting that he hopes they'll assimilate because he views his Christian culture as superior. Later, I'm going to be reading from an article that tries to downplay Jackson's racist views. It tries to claim that he was less a racist than someone interested in money. And while I do go through a bit about how industry and profit in today's global economy are saturated with institutional racism, the fact is Jackson shows here that he isn't just an institutional racist. He is at his core under the impression that his context as a white man is in every way imaginable superior. In any other context, this would be mere xenophobia. But in the context of white Europeans having set up a racial hierarchy, where their white race was the best of all races, and where they had the power to enforce their prejudices by law, this became understood as white supremacy, and the U.S. was codified as a nation for white people and superior white rights, specifically white male rights, from its inception. Just to keep the timeline straight, Jackson's war career predated his presidency. The War of 1812 lasted until 1815. He served two terms as President of the United States from 1829 to 1837. Martin Van Buren continued the removal policies, including the Trail of Tears, during his single term in office from 1837 to 1841. Jackson negotiated a lot of treaties during this time, and I wanted to go through at least one to show how he negotiated. Nothing about the following example is extraordinary. This is how Jackson operated. 
At the end of 1835, about halfway through his second term as president, Jackson negotiated something called the Treaty of New Ekota. This document gave the Cherokee two years to clear out of U.S. claimed territory and move to territory in what is now modern-day Oklahoma. What's interesting is that the article I read about this also stated that, quote, the Chickasaws and Choctaws had readily accepted and signed treaties with the U.S. government while the Creeks did so under coercion, unquote. To me, that sentence makes it sound like the Creeks were forced, but the Chickasaw and Choctaw people consented and volunteered to move. I remember someone once saying that consent is saying yes when it's safe to say no. We have read Jackson's own public-facing words where he describes the extermination and assimilation of Native Americans as a foregone conclusion. We have seen his willingness to use his power over the military to advance his personal white supremacist goals. Jackson deployed military forces in unorthodox ways to put down the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in 1831. And as discussed earlier, when Jackson saw the state of Georgia illegally enforcing its authority on land that belonged to Native Americans under the law, his response was to stand down and do nothing and refuse to enforce the law. We also saw in Jackson's War of 1812 and his resolve there to take the territory from opposing powers, including Native people. So when I hear that the Choctaw were readily accepting of moving, I'm skeptical of the consent and voluntary implication of this wording. George W. Harkins was then the chief of the Choctaw Nation. He wrote a statement that I believe is potentially dripping with sarcasm. He addressed it to the American people, and he expressed the following, quote, It is with considerable diffidence that I attempt to address the American people, knowing and feeling sensibly my incompetency, and believing that your highly and well-improved minds would not be well entertained by the address of a Choctaw. But having determined to emigrate west of the Mississippi River this fall, I have thought proper in bidding you farewell to make a few remarks expressive of my views and the feelings that actuate me on the subject of our removal. We as Choctaws rather choose to suffer and be free than live under the degrading influence of laws which our voice could not be heard in their formation, How is this not coercion? He's saying plainly that they're being given a choice of harsh existence in new lands or remaining under an oppressive legal system where they are dehumanized and without representation. It was absolutely not safe to say no. So their yes is not voluntary or consensual. And as if an open statement explaining the coercion was not evidence enough, several thousand Choctaw remained in the territory legally. And historian Walter Williams provides the following quote about their experiences there. The Choctaws, quote, have had our habitations torn down and burned, our fences destroyed, cattle turned into our fields, and we ourselves have been scourged, manacled, fettered, and otherwise personally abused until by such treatment some of our best men have died." It was not safe to say no. This was a contract signed under immense duress. But this is whitewashing. Let's reread that line from the article again. The Chickasaws and Choctaws had readily accepted and signed treaties with the U.S. government, while the Creeks did so under coercion. It is clearly implying that the Choctaw were not coerced, but when your choice is to leave or to stay and be murdered and know that we won't defend or protect you as human beings, that's coercion. When the chief declares the choice is to remain under oppressive laws and those that stay describe how they are outright murdered by white settlers and citizens, how does a modern telling of this story categorize this as being, quote, readily accepting, unquote, of an agreement as opposed to having been coerced? That's what whitewashing looks like. Another round of removal that happened around 1832 involved areas in Florida and the Seminole tribes. I actually attended Seminole County Schools in Florida. But in 1832, seven chiefs were sent to inspect a new reservation site. They were there for several months and had a chance to speak to the Creeks who were already settled there. A statement was signed the next year, 1833, 
that said the new location was acceptable. Once the chiefs returned to Florida, some of them said they had not signed it. Some of them said they were forced to sign it. And they also said something that reminded me of my acquaintance who works in Guatemala, that they did not have the power to decide this issue for all of the nations impacted. And no sooner did the U.S. government understand they were facing resistance than Florida began preparing for war. Again, this is duress. Sign or we will mount violence against you is not the foundation of a legal land deal. An article in Politico, which is macabrely named How Jackson Made a Killing in Real Estate, reads as follows, quote, It's also well known that Jackson was involved in expelling American Indians from their homelands, which is how he made room to create so much of the modern South. But it's not well understood why Jackson made Indian removal a central theme of his career. Jackson was making space for the spread of white settlers, including those who practiced slavery, and he was enabling real estate development in which he participated and profited. One titanic land grab shows how Jackson operated. It was the seizure of the Tennessee River Valley, where the Great River bends in what is present-day Alabama. While serving as a U.S. Army general, Jackson wrested control of the valley from Cherokees and turned it into an explosive real estate opportunity. Jackson and several friends made off with a breathtaking 45,000 acres, colonized the area, and even founded a new city. They then established multiple cotton plantations run by enslaved laborers just as cotton prices were reaching record highs. All told, Jackson both created and scored in the greatest real estate bubble in the history of the United States up to that time, unquote. So an ethical question arises here, and I want to be clear. Jackson's deals while he was in the military preceded his presidential career, but certainly he was still involved in profit from land even while he was president. He was owning and operating a large 420-plus acre plantation that grew to over a 1,000 acres. So if I'm in political office, can I use that political position and power to create public laws and policies that financially benefit me or my friends directly while I'm actively engaged in business or they're actively engaged in business? Intuitively, I would think that wouldn't be legal, but in reality, I couldn't find any prohibitions. And I want to talk more about that in a moment, but first I have to take us on another side trip. I want to address some other whitewashing that was in this same article. The first example said this, quote, The story of that land grab helped us see Jackson clearly. He's sometimes portrayed as an Indian hater, a description that misses his complexity. He could treat Indians and white men equally. During the War of 1812, his army included a regiment of Cherokees, and Jackson promised them pay and benefits equal to white soldiers, in every respect on the same footing, as he wrote. After the war, Jackson discovered that the widows of his Cherokee soldiers had never received proper death benefits. He wrote his superiors in Washington, insisting that the Cherokees must be placed in the same situation of the wives and children of our soldiers who have fell in battle, end quote. This is similar to the argument used to justify or excuse white supremacist race-based slavery by saying, well, some black people participated in the slave trade as well. We even hear a modern version today when there's a racist police shooting and the cop that does the shooting is black. People think this is some sort of gotcha, as though marginalized people can't be used as tokens against their own communities. It's like, White supremacists think that if they can enlist a black person to assist a white supremacist agenda, then suddenly it can't be white supremacist anymore. Because look, we were able to get this or that black person or black group to help us do racist damage. It stems from a basic misunderstanding about what constitutes racism, and it's interesting that in surveys, white people are more likely to think about racism on individual levels tied to motivation, but the people actually impacted by racism are more likely to view it as being tied to institutional power imbalance and impact. So in the case of the slavery narrative, if you're isolating the analysis to a black African tribe raiding and enslaving another tribe, then you're not going to view it as white supremacy because you're not pulling back far enough to see the full picture. It's like looking at a painting of a battle and only viewing a tiny patch of grass in the lower right corner of the canvas. When you're asked what you're looking at, you say, a painting of grass. The larger picture is one where white European powers were battling with each other over dominance for power and money. 
And if they could enlist and use the people they were exploiting to exploit each other, they were only too happy to do that. But follow the slave trade hierarchy up the money chain, and at the top weren't African tribes or black people. Those pulling the strings and raking in the profits were Europeans, especially the Portuguese and the British. Jackson's saying that he will pay people equally to slaughter, displace, and destroy Native American people and culture regardless of who's willing to do it isn't really a testament to his love of Native Americans or a demonstration that he was not a white supremacist who viewed these people and their culture as less than. In fact, his own words, as we have seen, say it outright. He definitely did not see them or their culture as equal. He saw it as inferior and destined to make way for his own superior culture and people. And don't get me wrong, I know that public-facing statements don't always reflect the honest feelings of the speaker. But in this case, Jackson was clearly trying to portray his benevolence for Native Americans, and it still came out sounding horribly white supremacist. I feel pretty comfortable saying that when you're trying to not sound white supremacist and you still come out sounding totally white supremacist, I believe you're white supremacist. And it puts me in mind of another form of whitewashing that we do. This article is trying to say that we can't paint Jackson as a white supremacist who thought less of indigenous people because he paid everyone the same wages to help him slaughter indigenous people. And I guess they would like us to ignore for a moment that he owned a huge number of black slaves. I run up against this same wall in some folks when I point out that Abraham Lincoln was a white supremacist. He was an abolitionist. But abolition was not a question of white supremacy, but a question of the ethics and morality of the institution of slavery. Lincoln did not view black people as deserving of the same participation and rights in society because he was a white supremacist. These people in his mind were not as human as white people. Here are Lincoln's own words toward the end of his life on the issue of black people and the right to vote. The context is post-Civil War, and the elective franchise that he mentions is the act of voting. Quote, It is also unsatisfactory to some that the elective franchise is not given to the colored man. I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. Unquote. Notice the caveats. First, this is absolutely for men only, but he's saying that he's open to allowing black men to vote if they can show they're smart enough, or if they serve in the military. So, Lincoln's vision of black voting is one that comes with voter restrictions that he would not put on white male voters. Today, when we see racist voting restrictions, we recognize it as racist and problematic. But the article that features this information about Lincoln outlining black voter restrictions is literally titled, quote, Abraham Lincoln promoted black voting rights, unquote. I suppose technically this is true, but when I tell you that someone supports black voting rights, it puts an image in your mind that does not align with what Lincoln is saying. That's whitewashing. If I told you that the Texas legislature was going to put requirements on black voters to do military service or pass an IQ test in order to obtain a voter registration card, you probably would not describe that as, quote, promoting black voting rights, unquote. But the bar we use for history is on the floor. The very worst moral and ethical examples. And if someone does better than horrible, we give them praise for it. From what I've seen since I started noticing it, the impact is that it trains marginalized people to celebrate their own oppression. And I'll explain that in a bit. But first I want to look at another quote from this article. It goes on to say, quote, While this seems a rather mild support for African-American suffrage, it was actually radical for its time. Lincoln understood that for many, if not most Northerners, being anti-slavery did not necessarily mean they were for equal rights for free or freed black men, unquote. I appreciate that they point out that being anti-slavery is not the same as not being a white supremacist, but they're grading on a curve here. I sometimes mention my prior activism, but I try not to go too deep into it. I think folks know that what I'm doing now with this podcast is something very different. However, this really puts me in mind of one of the things I used to encounter, and I'd like to touch on it, if only for a moment, because I can't help but see a stark similarity that I think is both relevant and helpful. 
I used to do atheist activism, and I recall pretty often talking to believers about the culture that produced much of their Bible. I would point out that this was a culture that subjugated women and committed genocides and enforced slavery, and very often they would say that these folks were living in a time and in a context where they just didn't know any better. And I would ask them why they would base very important parts of their life on the ideas of a culture that they recognize has to be excused in this way. That is, if you realize that there's something better than genocide and slavery and subjugation of women, why reach back to that as your ethical or moral guide? Why would you use people who didn't know better than that as your examples of greatness, like Abraham who wanted to sacrifice his own human child to his God? In general, most secular people understood what I was getting at, but Now that I no longer focus on religion in this way, I see these same mindsets used when we look at the history of colonialism. Suddenly, we look at a white man with wealth and power and we see him saying that the only way a black man should be allowed to vote is if he can demonstrate he's intelligent enough or if he's willing to fight in the military for the U.S., and we praise that as progressive for his time. Instead of observing how utterly backward that culture was to think of that as progressive, Again, when I was doing atheist activism, I had people say that slavery of the Hebrews was progressive for its time, because it had restrictions on how severely you could beat a slave. But do I really want to make that something that we today look at with reverence? Or do I want to observe that the culture was so saturated with white supremacy and even the best examples we can find are up to their necks in racist thinking and beliefs? Why is the narrative, how great is this man for his contextually progressive thoughts, as opposed to, how sad is it that racism was such a profound part of the fabric of the society that a president could promote voter restrictions on black men and not be ashamed and embarrassed by it? Why is the measuring stick for how racist a white historical figure is the very worst racist examples we can find, rather than the ideal of non-racism? So we should celebrate race-based voter restrictions because, hey, at least it's not race-based slavery. I'm going to say it's okay to call them both abhorrent. People sometimes reply by suggesting that in a hundred years my own views will be seen as abhorrent, and what then? My answer is that I'm okay if people consider my views abhorrent and don't make statues of me. Or, if there are statues of me for whatever reason, and someone pulls them down because of the harmful things I did or said, Know that I don't want them punished. I don't need a statue of myself. No one does. Again, it was like the religious people who used to compare Hebrew slavers to the worst slavers possible, not to the better idea of no slavery. If someone assaults me and beats me until I'm sent to the ER, my reaction to that isn't, what a wonderful person for not beating me into the morgue. They shouldn't be enslaving me or beating me at all, and if I realize that, then why would I try to find ways to praise a violent slaveholder? It's not praiseworthy they beat their slaves to a lesser degree. It's sad that that was ever the metric for what constitutes a humane person. It's about perspective. During International Women's Day, there was a post I saw celebrating Mary Edwards Walker, a medical doctor who won a Medal of Honor. People were celebrating on the thread in the comments section, so I did some digging and I found that in the history of this medal, over 3,500 of these have been awarded, and only one has ever gone to a woman, Mary Walker, and that was in 1865. Additionally, I don't know how Mary Walker experienced gender identity, but I'm not even fully convinced that Mary Walker, if she were alive today, would identify as a woman. But still, Mary is hailed as the Single Woman Medal of Honor recipient. So, is one woman Medal of Honor recipient among 3,520 really cause for celebration? Or is that a national shame? To me, it's asking me to celebrate my own oppression. Oh, and if anyone's interested, out of that 3,520, 95 have gone to black men, 29 to Native Americans, and 36 to Asian Americans. And now you see why scripting is hard for me. I have trouble keeping to the script, literally, because there are so many items of interest that lead me down so many different paths. Do you even notice that we left off talking about a Politico article about Andrew Jackson? If so, I apologize if it's annoying when I take these segues, but this is my brain all day, all the time. So the article at Politico had just tried to say that 
Jackson didn't really think Native Americans were less than compared to his own white people and white culture. It then adds, quote, What motivated him to treat natives unfairly at times was less racism than real estate. He would stop at nothing when he saw an opportunity to advance his financial interest or that of his friends. Land was the way to wealth on the frontier, and that drove Jackson's elaborate scheme to capture immense Indian lands south and north of the Tennessee River, unquote. The problem here is, again, the framing of racism as an individual problem rather than something systemic. It ignores that the struggle happening here is founded in white supremacist culture and notions of land rights and deeds, and that the picture we see as we step back is one of white European powers fighting one another for control of land and resources based on white European notions of legal land ownership being forced upon a non-white culture that does not share or agree to those conditions or notions. And all of this is simultaneously justified by saying that these people are savages who need to make way for a superior white culture, which is labeled in this whitewashed narrative as progress and civilization. It is demonstrably true, and I do not deny it, that Jackson demonstrated he was just as willing to kill other Europeans to gain his power. French, Spanish, British, But what's happening here is that we have a white European free-for-all happening for land and resources that can be converted into wealth and power to then obtain more land and resources in a never-ending cycle that is still happening to this day under modern capitalism, which is just a continuation of colonialism. That is, white supremacist colonialism didn't end. It's still ongoing. The other night I watched The Way of Water. And I had the same dark observations that I had when I watched Avatar. We have white people in a white industry making money off a film that shows a fantasy context for white supremacy and colonialism. And the money they make is coming from audiences that are cheering for the indigenous people against the colonizers, while simultaneously benefiting from the real-world earth colonial destruction of land and resources and indigenous displacement, genocide, and slavery as we sit and watch the film. A friend of mine on social media posted that they liked the movie. And that's fine. They can like the movie. People like movies for different reasons. I posted a comment, and it wasn't a judgment on them liking the movie. It was about why I can't enjoy these films. I wrote, quote, I just watched it last night. The thing I have trouble with is how exploitative the films are. White man in capitalist culture makes money hand over fist by selling the disappearing native narrative to people in the culture that not only has caused the destruction for hundreds of years, but continues to do so. The very cell phone I'm using to type this comment exists because of child labor in the Congo in coltan mines. So when I watch the movies, I'm keenly aware... I am the corporate raider in those films, but wishing that I could cheer for the indigenous population, I'm fueling the very destruction on the screen that I pretend to oppose, and it's too hypocritical for me to enjoy it. End quote. And the raiders in the film are no different than Jackson and no different than I am as I walk around with my cell phone. Do I hate black children in the Congo? No. Do cell phone manufacturers hate black children in the Congo? I have no reason to believe they do. I am totally willing to believe that what they're doing, as this article stated, is more to do with wealth and power than with some sort of personal racist agenda against black Congolese children. But that does not mean it's not also racist. The Politico article is focusing on the patch of grass in the painting. It's saying that it's more about money than racism. And that's not true, because the two things aren't separable. When you pull back from the painting, you see the whole system is about racism, about colonialism, still building wealth and power. It never really stopped. Europe outsourced it to areas it wanted to exploit to have on-site management of the extraction of resources. The U.S. emancipated itself so that it could control the exploitation, the resources and labor, directly without paying overhead to a king. We still use prisons for cheap labor and slave labor. But we also often outsource industry in order to avoid environmental regulations and sidestep workers' rights. In other countries, they also have laws protecting workers. But in many cases, they are even less enforced than they are within the U.S., 
Within the U.S., we have immigrant children working in dangerous meatpacking lines and slaughterhouses more than two decades after the novel Fast Food Nation was published, exposing the problem of immigrant exploitation in that industry. And if you've seen the film version, it's absolutely not the book. It's no coincidence that we're buying from mines in the Congo where black children are working and dying. And it's no coincidence that our dangerous meat lines are using brown child labor. All of these situations, when you connect the dots, come right back to how the globe was sliced and diced and parceled out to white European interests. Right now, there's a struggle going on about whether or not Africa should, quote, be allowed, unquote, to redraw its own borders. Just Google, African countries can't draw their own borders, for an immediate list of how that continent is suffering in the post-colonial era, still because of the ongoing impact of colonialism and to see how many white people have opinions about how it needs to be addressed. So what Jackson was doing wasn't more about real estate than racism, because real estate, the model Jackson was using, was already a unilateral model of white European land rights and ownership. It's not either or, it's both. The U.S. forced a cultural construct that was shared by the other white nations they were battling. The native tribes weren't really in this struggle because Jackson was correct on this point. Their disappearance was a foregone conclusion. The French, the British, the Spanish, the U.S. had already decided they wanted complete control of the resources indigenous people were using. Native Americans really weren't going to have a say in what happened to them, no matter who won. Yes, they could get paid by Jackson to help build white U.S. wealth, but he was never going to give them access to land he thought had any value that could be exploited by the U.S. markets. In fact, his actions with regard to Georgia demonstrated that. He had no interest in using federal force to make that state and white settlers adhere to laws that protected Native American land rights. The sort of land expansion that Jackson was doing wasn't new to the U.S., it was just more extensive and fast-paced. And no, Jackson wasn't a U.S. founder, but his views on U.S. geographic growth did not originate with him. He was operating in a system that allowed black people to be enslaved, wars to be waged against Native Americans, women to be subjugated, and rights to be denied to anyone who wasn't white. He openly used the government to enrich and empower himself and his friends, and even to attack his political enemies. He followed the law when it suited him and ignored it when it didn't. In some regards, he was corrupt by the standards of his own time, and most definitely by those of our time. If you recall, I mentioned the religious risks of basing something as important as your life choices or moral decisions on the views of tribes that lived thousands of years ago, who thought slavery and genocide and subjugation of women and, let's just add, waging war against your neighbors to take their land, were fine ideas. Well, it's also a risk to run a nation based on a government and legal system that was created centuries ago by a small number of men who also thought slavery and genocide and subjugation of women and waging war to take land and resources away from people were fine ideas. Keep in mind, men like Jackson and Lincoln are not just excused today, they're revered today. Lincoln, the white supremacist who opposed race-based chattel slavery, has a monument in D.C., his face carved on Mount Rushmore, and is also featured on our $5 bill. And Jackson, whose wealth was built on genocide and slavery, is featured on our 20 But under our Constitution, again and again we see these things are never destroyed. They just change form. And Trump was a great example of how we really haven't changed much since Jackson, and really before Jackson. We balked at Trump charging high rates at his resorts for Secret Service staff. How dare he use the power of the office to line his pockets? As I read about Jackson, I had to ask when this shift in our model occurred. Jackson's money came directly from land and loads of the founder's money did as well. And they all oversaw policies to support land expansion. It's not a wonder Trump said Jackson was his favorite president. There are lots of similarities, and when people say Trump was the worst president ever, I ask myself which metrics make him worse than someone like Jackson. I had one friend who said they still think Trump was worse because although he didn't do everything Jackson did, he would have. And I'm not sure I disagree that Trump would have, but I still have to ask how the guy who actually did do all these things could be counted as a better president than the one who did some of them and merely would have done the rest. So what changed in this case? 
Believe it or not, it wasn't until 2017 that Democrats introduced something called the Presidential Conflicts of Interest Act. It would require the president and vice president to disclose and divest any potential financial conflicts of interest. It also would require presidential appointees to recuse themselves from any specific matters involving the president's financial conflicts of interest that come before their agencies. And at the time of this recording, according to the congress.gov website, this act has still not passed. Again, introduced in 2017. I also found a promising link to something called the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. I remember hearing a bit about it during the Trump presidency, so I looked at that. It reads, quote, No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state, unquote. Another passage tied to emoluments gets closer but still doesn't quite hit it. Quote, the president shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased or diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them, unquote, them being the individual states. When I looked at the analysis of this offered by Andrew Hamilton, his points seemed tied to the idea that the reason for this clause was to reduce influence on the president by the Congress or by any individual state of the union. Again, I didn't see any actual prohibition intended with regard to private income or even private corporate employment. So, no, that's not really what I'm talking about here. This isn't a foreign gift or a state trying to bribe the president, although Georgia came close. But I'm trying to see if it's legal for a president to be making money on real estate by speculation, expanding plantations, buying and selling land, while he's also holding a political office where he's hotly pursuing land expansion as one of his primary policies, including coerced real estate contracts, a.k.a. treaties, signed under threat of violence, waging wars with foreign powers, and doing ethnic cleansing and practical genocide to line the pockets of him and his wealthy friends. I found that since the 1970s, it's been normal for a president to provide tax returns. However, as Trump showed us, it's not actually a requirement. And if they do disclose and there is a conflict, I don't see any legal barriers to being elected. So this is a toothless policy or tradition or whatever we want to call it. But from a purely legal standpoint and point of view of the presidency, could the CEO of Exxon run for president, keep both positions, and use his connections in Congress to draft and pass legislation that reduces environmental restrictions for the fossil fuel industry? Could someone be making big land deals using land they were obtaining using the power of the presidency to take land from other nations by force? I also read threads where this question was asked and crowdsourced it myself. I'm not a lawyer or a historian, but if this is against the law, it's not easy to find a citation that points to the laws that make it illegal. So, unless I'm mistaken, not only did the founders make sure that it was completely legal to use the presidential power this way, but presidents from early on in our history used the presidential power this way. I know this was a lot of information to throw at an audience, and I'm not the best with organizational skills, but I hope you were able to follow it. I have a feeling that if I do more of these History Erased episodes, I'm going to find more and more situations like this where I think I'm going to be creating a story about one thing, but I wind up going down other paths. Believe it or not, there were so many more odd stories tied up in this issue that I finally decided to leave out, but I hope you got something out of it. Clearly, people will have all their own thoughts about these issues, and you may have heard something today that makes you go and Google even more paths of your own. It's all a journey in the end, so stay safe out there. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring experience and meaning in individuals and the broader society. Like and subscribe if you enjoy these talks. And in the meantime, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.